That was the national anthem being played at the under 17 World Cup for boys in 2017 at the Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium in Delhi. Today, uh, we are very privileged to be joined by the FIFA Head of Women's Football, Sarai Behrman. Welcome to this webinar, Sarai. Thank you very much for having me. You're most welcome. And we are absolutely thrilled and privileged to have someone who heads uh, women's football at FIFA Development to be joining this webinar on Indian women's football. And we are hopeful that we will gain a lot of insight into what FIFA's perspective is for women's football. Just to begin with, uh, Sarai, I'm going to just mention a couple of pointers uh, that I have gathered over the last few days, being in a dialogue with uh, coaches, parents, players, all the stakeholders involved with Indian women's football. The dialogue basically says there is a paucity of ecosystem, a lack of focus, lack of opportunity at the grassroots level. While our national team has done very, very well in the last couple of years compared to what they used to do, at the grassroots level football, there is a need for more investment, better refereeing, a little more awareness, basically a little more positivity around women's football in India. So that's the current scenario with football in India. And um, that's what we are reaching out to you for. And we are waiting to hear what you have to say is FIFA's perspective here. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to join you uh, this afternoon. And uh, I think this is a really fantastic uh, initiative and I'd like to congratulate you uh, and the team, uh, PIFA Foundation. Um, it's really important during uh, moments like this that we stay connected and uh, we keep the, the spotlight on the women's game. And this is a really fantastic way for our community to keep in touch with each other and to keep the conversation going about women's football. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I hope that I will be able to give you guys some interesting insights and uh, answer some of your questions today. Fantastic, sir. I am sure you're going to do a fabulous job. <laughs> Um, so should I start with? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, share my screen. I've prepared for you guys a, a short uh, presentation, which I hope will give you some insights about uh, women's football from FIFA level. Um, also for you to understand a little bit about the work that we're doing uh, at a global level. Um, and then hopefully that will uh, help to lead into some of the discussions that we will have uh, later on. So let me try and share my screen. Are you able to do that, Sarai? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. Can everybody see that? Perfect, perfect. Okay, perfect. 
So, yeah, I guess um, I understand that a lot of the, the people that are tuning in today are, are from uh, Mumbai. <laughs> and uh, Actually, all over India. Sorry, all, over? all over? Okay, wow. Well. Yes, all over India, yes. All right, fantastic. Well, in the last uh, in the last twelve months, I've had the privilege of being able to travel uh, to India twice now uh, as part of the build up to the Under Seventeen Women's World Cup, and uh, I was also there for the finals of the Under Seventeen uh, World Cup in Calcutta uh, a few years ago, and that was an incredible experience. And I have to say, I've really fallen in love with your country and the people. And uh, I'm really, really excited to uh, to come back there as soon as things start to clear up a little bit with the uh, with the coronavirus. So we can't really talk about women's football at FIFA without first talking about the Women's World Cup. Um, the Women's World Cup we had in France last year was the biggest and most successful uh, edition of the competition, um, and. It is in itself the single biggest female sporting event in the world. So for those of us that are involved in women's football uh, and especially at FIFA level, we see the Women's World Cup as the best opportunity every four years to showcase our game, to showcase our athletes, to put the spotlight onto uh, the values and everything that comes along side women's football to try and popularize our sport, to get more participants and to, uh, of course, grow uh, the commercial elements of the game as well. So speaking about milestone moments, some of you might recognize this image. This was taken after the final in the 1999 edition of the FIFA Women's World Cup. And it was after the USA bet China on penalties. And Brandy Chastain, who you can see in the image, she scored uh, the winning penalty. And she whipped off her shirt and you could see her athletic torso. This image became, uh, you know, one of the most popular images in the women's game. Um, and it's something that really marked um, the coming of women's football onto the global scale. If we fast forward 20 years later to last year in France, I'm sure I don't need to introduce to you guys uh, the name of this athlete. Um, France was also a massive milestone moment for women's football. And the big difference between what we saw in France uh, to what we saw in 1999 in USA was TV. Uh, TV made a huge, huge impact for us last year. We were able to get a massive number of people viewing the game from around the world. And we saw that the France World Cup was really what catapulted women's football into the mainstream, into the global audience, and really made our athletes and the sport take center stage. So we were able to break records last year. We had more than 1.2 billion people around the world uh, tuning in to watch the Women's World Cup. Uh, the average global audience for the live uh, matches was in excess of 15 million people. And we had 62 media rights uh, holders in France broadcasting to a record 206 territories all around the world. And that is 68% more territories around the world that were viewing the Women's World Cup than the previous edition, which was 2015 in Canada. So this was a really, really awesome moment uh, for women's football in terms of viewership on TV. All right. All right. Yeah. Can I just interrupt you over here? Please. Uh, we, are, we, are going to, we, are, we are able to see your notes. Could you just reduce that screen, please? Okay, sure. Yeah, just reduce the note screen so we can see the main screen. Perfect. That's fine. Sorry, okay. sorry, sorry to interrupt. No problem. I will go without my notes. I should be able to. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we also had a massive amount of digital engagement. Uh, we saw that the, the digital platforms, the audience increased uh, in the month of June by more than 25%. 
um, from what we had had in the past. We also had the FIFA Women's World Cup, uh, a special dedicated app. It was the most uh, downloaded app across 33 countries, which was amazing for us. And the digital channels also had uh, recorded, you know, 1.2 billion views, uh, of which 200 million were video views. So we were able to also gain through this last edition of the Women's World Cup, a very good understanding of the, how our fans are consuming the game from a digital point of view. And this is something that is really, really important for us as we move to commercialize women's football. Um, the digital platforms give us a really good understanding of how our fans want to consume our game and what type of content um, really makes them tick. So after uh, the Women's World Cup, what was uh, really important for us was to understand how can we leverage the popularity and the momentum that was created by this event to accelerate the growth of the women's game. So earlier this year, uh, the FIFA president Gianni Infantino, together with the FIFA management board, uh, of which I'm uh, representing women's football within that board, we all got together and uh, we wanted to realign our objectives for the next four year period. And what came out of that was the vision uh, 2020 to 2023. It covers all aspects of football, but what was important for me and important for women's football was one of the key parts of that new vision uh, was to accelerate the growth of women's football. And uh, our president, together with many of the decision makers uh, that were present in France and saw the impact of the Women's World Cup, really understood at that point in time the massive opportunity that exists uh, for women's football. So these are some of the very high level uh, mechanisms that we will be working on over the next four years, um, including the reform of our competitions. We know after especially having seen through the Women's World Cup and the Youth World Cups, uh, of which India will be hosting uh, the under 17 next year, that competitions act as a fantastic top-down driver of the development for women's football. So it's important at FIFA level that we look at what we have now at an international level in terms of competitions, and we try to understand how can we optimize those competitions to ensure that the impact on development is much broader than what it is now. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. The other thing that's really important is the commercial side of women's football. Uh, for a long time, women's football has been viewed as a pure cost exercise. Um, it's something that has been heavily subsidized by the men's game. And it's important that we are able to show that women's football in itself is also a strong commercial product which will help us to unlock, I think, uh, a lot of the barriers that exist uh, at the ground level around things like resource, uh, perception, uh, funding, all these types of issues. We have 211 member associations in FIFA, uh, of which uh, the AIFF is one. And we have development programs that we roll out uh, to every one of those 211 countries to support them in also developing women's football. So we want to modernize those and make sure that they're having a positive impact, as well as enhancing uh, the professionalization of women's football at the top level. And what is really cool is uh, one of the things that was announced at the closing press conference of the World Cup, which was music to my ears, was uh, that we would dedicate a 1 billion USD of funding over the next four year period specifically for women's football, um, which is really important in terms of resource, but also for FIFA to send a message uh, to all the member associations, clubs, and those organizations leading women's football that you need to invest in the women's game in order to see the returns and to really realize uh, the opportunities that exist. So in uh, 2018, we launched uh, the first ever global strategy for women's football. And it consists of a framework which covers five areas of the women's game. 
And what's really important about this, and I understand that there are uh, many people who are tuned in today who are working at the grassroots level uh, involved in women's football, is we developed this framework uh, specifically so that it can be adopted at every level. So you'll see the five uh, pillars, which I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail. We designed these five pillars because we know it doesn't matter where you are in the world, whether you're in India or Germany or Samoa or New Zealand, these same five areas cut across all levels of women's football. So it's a really excellent framework for not only FIFA, but also our stakeholders to start to adopt a plan or a clear strategy if they don't already have one around how they're going to develop football um, at their level. So once we developed the women's football strategy in 2018, we launched it and now we have embarked on um, a series of different programs and projects uh, linking to each of these five pillars and the objectives that we've set out. And if you want to uh, dig a bit deeper in the strategy, for those of you that are interested in uh, establishing strategies in your own area for women's football. The full thing is available on fifa.com. It's designed as a resource that everyone in the women's game can use. Uh, so please, please take advantage of that. I'm gonna quickly touch on the five areas and then uh, that will be it from me and I'll give you guys a chance to ask some questions. So the first pillar of our strategy is develop and grow. Uh, and you can imagine uh, from a FIFA level, this is very difficult because we're dealing with 211 countries where uh, the levels of women's football, also the development, uh, the resources that are available to them are vastly, vastly different. Um, and we saw already, for example, at the World Cup last year, uh, if you were watching, seven out of the eight quarter finalists were coming from Europe. So one of the trends that we're seeing in women's football is that there seems to be a high concentration of talent and a lot more development in the European region. And that's something that we FIFA would like to change uh, by really supporting uh, global growth of the game, which I think is really important in terms of popularizing our sport and also commercializing it. So these are some of the examples of programs that we are delivering under that development pillar. Uh, we have a football for schools program, uh, which we will hopefully be launching in India very soon in the build up to the under 17 Women's World Cup. We have special development programs, which all the 211 countries, including India can apply for. And those programs are things like uh, league support to establish new leagues at senior and youth level, uh, club licensing, which is a program that is especially focused on strengthening the leagues and professionalizing the clubs in the different countries. We also have a special women's football campaign, which is a program targeted at driving participation. So how do we attract young girls into the game? How do we give them a positive, awesome, fun experience of their first time in football? And we have a women's football campaign as part of these programs that uh, is designed to do that. We also are focusing a lot in the development area on competitions and leagues. Uh, one of the things that we've uh, realized over the past few years is whilst there seems to be a lot of interest and growing uh, numbers wanting to join women's football, it's very, very difficult to retain participation and to keep those girls in the game if we don't have regular playing opportunities for them. Uh, so we're really focusing on doubling the number of youth leagues, especially around the world. And this will be a big focus for us also as part of uh, the legacy for the Under-17 Women's World Cup, which will be uh, in India. We also focus a lot under development on capacity building. So there's lots of really passionate men and women around the world who are in charge of uh, building the women's game on the ground. And we have a lot of programs available which are focused on helping those people uh, to build their capacity um, and enhance their experience so that they can deliver the best that they can on the ground. 
and uh, we are, um, well, I personally, having worked in a federation many years ago, I know that we can't succeed in any of our objectives if it wasn't for those people on the ground, like yourself, Anjali, and many of those that are tuning in, who are passionately working every day to try and drive uh, the development of women's football. The second pillar is showcase the game, and this is all about competitions. So we have our World Cups. I talked about the, the Women's World Cup. The next one in 2023 is going to be expanded to 32 teams, which is really exciting. Uh, we'll be voting to appoint a host uh, very shortly for that competition. So that will be the next cycle uh, of building up for a Women's World Cup. We also have the youth competitions, which are a really, really important milestone, especially for young uh, female players. And the under-17 uh, next year in India, I'm sure, is going to be another huge milestone. The event in 2017 for the boys was the biggest under-17 Youth World Cup that FIFA has ever had um, that was hosted in India. And I'm really uh, hopeful and excited to see that same level of interest and engagement for the women's uh, under-17 World Cup as well. I talked to you guys about how, uh, briefly about how competitions for us is a real top down driver uh, of development. Um, and it's one of the best mechanisms that we have at FIFA to help uh, drive the growth uh, down through the pyramids of football. So we're looking at the competitions at a global level now. Uh, and one example uh, uh, I can give you is a, a Club World Cup for women. At the moment, there doesn't exist uh, a Club World Cup for women. There hasn't uh, been one ever. We only have two confederations at the moment that organize a continental club competition. So we've got UEFA, who have uh, the UEFA Women's uh, Champions League, and Comnibol, they have what they call the Copa Libertadores, which is uh, their women's club competition. So AFC, uh, which is where you guys are, they had a pilot competition last year with four clubs as a kind of a test pilot. But the idea is if we uh, organize a Club World Cup at FIFA level, that will encourage the other confederations to have regional club competitions, which will in turn encourage uh, the leagues and the member countries and the clubs in those member countries uh, to professionalize their standards and increase uh, their participation as well. So that's one example uh, of, of what we're looking at at a global level um, to try and drive development through competition. Um, the next pillar is communicate and commercialize. This for me is very, very important, uh, not only at FIFA level, but across the globe with all of our member associations. Uh, we want to have a dedicated commercial program for women's football. Um, for the first time in 2023, the next Women's World Cup, that will be the first edition uh, of the Women's World Cup where we are able to sell uh, some of the media rights and also the partnership rights separately to the men. So what's happened in the past is if you are a broadcaster or a FIFA partner, and you are interested uh, in the Men's World Cup, you buy the rights to the Men's World Cup, and the Women's World Cup and the youth competitions are all bundled in a package and sold together with the Men's World Cup. And that has been uh, very beneficial uh, because women's football, uh, particularly at a FIFA level, is able to um, develop with the funds that are coming from the commercialization of the Men's World Cup. But it has also meant that we have never been able to recognize the, the commercial value of our Women's World Cup and women's football on its own. So now we've seen the success, um, certainly last year uh, in France and even in Canada in 2015, it's important that we start to push women's football as its own commercial product. And 2023 will be the first World Cup that we will be able to uh, unlock uh, a lot of those uh, commercial partnerships and contracts. The other thing I mentioned to you is about digital innovation. Um, it's no secret. I mean, we're all now 
uh, tuning in to each other via uh, digital platform. Many are on their phones and tablets. The way that our fans are consuming the game is completely changing. And women's football, I think more so than the men's game, has a real opportunity to evolve with those digital changes. If you understand the men's game, it's very, very saturated commercially in terms of the broadcast rights that are sold, the partners that are involved. Women's football, in contrast to that, is quite in its infancy from a commercial perspective. So we have a real chance right now to, uh, to really embrace uh, the digital age in the way that we look to commercialize and grow and develop our game uh, from a communication perspective. And I feel very strongly about that. And that's something particularly in the build up to the next World Cup that we will be working on um, and putting quite a bit of resource into. And I think under 17 Women's World Cup in India will be a fantastic way for us to also see what kind of innovations that we can make um, in India as well. So govern and lead is really, really important. Um, I had a, a, an opportunity to speak a little bit to Anjali before we jumped on this call. And uh, she's actually a prime example of, of a woman in a position of leadership in a decision-making body uh, in one of our member associations that is making a big impact for women's football in, in India. And what we need to see, and the idea behind this uh, pillar of our work is to try and get more and more uh, Anjali's all around the world at many different levels of football, um, so that we have representatives who are in those decision-making bodies, who are at the board tables, uh, who are involved in those discussions about the future of football in the different countries. So we have some really nice programs around developing leadership, uh, we also have some, uh, some clear objectives uh, at FIFA level. We have standing committees. We want a minimum of one third of those standing committee members to be female. Um, we also look at the regulations. So this is um, maybe the not so exciting part of football, but there's a, a big regulatory framework that governs our sport. And in women's football, we have to really uh, examine the regulatory framework and try to see how can we use that framework to make, uh, to make gains and to accelerate the growth for women's football. Um, and a good example of that uh, I can touch on is uh, the International Transfer Matching System, ITMS. And I don't know how many of you guys know about that, but the ITMS system is a system that FIFA runs and it basically tracks the movement of every single international transfer for every player. So when one professional player uh, signs a contract for a new club and they're moving internationally, the system tracks uh, when did that take place? Was it in contract? Was it out of contract? How much is the salary? Was there a transfer fee? and all the details around that. So in the past, the system, which gives us some very, very valuable data, it didn't include women's football. So what we did was in the regulatory framework, we just put uh, two words inside the regulations for that system. And those two words were, and woman. And because of that, two word change, we, since the 1st of January in 2018, we have also been able to track all the international movements for women's football professional players as well. And you can imagine the type of data that we now have. We get to see, uh, are these transfers happening in contract? Are they happening out of contract? How much are the salaries that these players are getting paid? Um, you know, when are the movements taking place and what are the trends? Where are the players coming from? Where are they going to? What are the strongest leagues and clubs? Um, it gives us a really, really valuable understanding how at the top end of the game, uh, how quickly the game is evolving. And that's important because, because it's evolving so fast, 
we have to adjust the kind of support that we're offering uh, to the elite game. So that's one small example of a, a tiny change in the regulations that has enabled us to have a huge uh, understanding of the elite end of, of our game. And then the final pillar is uh, educate and empower. This one is for me one that I feel very, very passionate about. Um, it's about basically the power of football. And football is by far and away the most popular sport globally. Uh, it's not in India yet. I know we're competing with cricket, but hopefully we'll get there. <laughs> but globally, it is the most popular sport in the world. And we FIFA and also our member associations, we are obliged to use that platform to make a positive difference and a positive impact in society. And when you have a tool like football, which is able to reach so many millions of people all around the world, and in our case, women and girls, we have to use the power of football to try and make a positive impact in those people's lives. And that's in a nutshell what this uh, pillar is all about. So I don't wanna take up too much time on this. Uh, that's basically it in terms of uh, the presentation. I hope it was able to give you a kind of a little bit of an overview, a very high level overview of, of how we're operating at FIFA level. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions or go deeper into detail on, on any areas that you guys are interested in. Thank you so much, Sarai. That was such an enlightening presentation. And uh, for I, I think I share everyone's sentiment on this uh, forum when I say there are so many things that have come really surprise, surprising to all of us. And, uh, but we're very happy that so much is being done at FIFA level for everyone to take this women's game to the next level and on par with the men's game. Uh, a personal question I would like to ask you uh, before I bring in all the other questions from everyone else. Um, give me a little history about how you got into the game and your journey to FIFA. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, well, uh, where do I start? So I, I uh, grew up in New Zealand. I, I'm originally from New Zealand. Um, I grew up with uh, three brothers and uh, we are always uh, have been a very, very sporting family. Uh, so in New Zealand, the most popular sport is rugby. We have the All Blacks and every young child's dream in New Zealand was to grow up and be an All Black. And uh, I was no different. I played rugby for a long time uh, in my youth uh, before I switched to football. Um, so my mother is Samoan and my father is Dutch, he's from the Netherlands. And when I was in uh, my twenties, I had an opportunity to visit Samoa for the first time. And by then I had been playing football, I was playing club football and uh, I had fallen in love with the game. And uh, while I was in Samoa, uh, visiting uh, basically my mother's family and trying to understand more about my culture, uh, there was an advertisement uh, in the local newspaper there uh, for a position in the Football Federation of the country. So I uh, obviously loved playing football and this was kind of a, a bit of a dream job for me. So I thought, why not try and see if I can, you know, uh, get this position. So I ended up applying, they interviewed me and uh, my small holiday to Samoa, I ended up being a, a seven year stay in the country. Uh, and I ended up leading uh, the football federation as the CEO there. So that is uh, for me where I really started to fall in love with the game. I had always uh, loved it as a player uh, I played as a central midfielder and I was also a defender towards the, the end of my playing career. Um, but when I started to work in football administration, that's when I really understood how powerful football is, especially as a tool uh, to make a positive difference for people. And uh, I had a really unique opportunity while I was in Samoa to grow the sport there from the ground up. 
and uh, that's where my journey started. Um, if we fast forward a few years later, um, and this is something that I think is really important, especially now, um, in this moment that we're going through with coronavirus, in 2015, there was a big scandal in FIFA. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you guys know it. I mean, I wasn't involved at that time at FIFA level, but there was a big scandal um, which uh, created a very dark moment for football and, and for FIFA. And uh, it was actually that scandal that created an opportunity for women's football, uh, for women in football, and also for me as an individual. So uh, I was part of a, a reform committee that got pulled together um, to try and reform FIFA as an organization. And because I had had this experience in Samoa for six years, uh, developing uh, the game there from the ground up, I was the representative of the Pacific region inside that reform committee. And it just so happened to be that I was also the only woman inside that committee. And so that started uh, for me, uh, my journey with women's football, because I advocated within that reform process to have more women uh, in decision-making bodies, um, to have more resource and more funding for women's football, um, and to put into the constitution and the statutes of FIFA, um, the necessity for things like gender equality and representing women's football across all the decision-making bodies. So that was a really uh, amazing experience to be part of that committee. And as a result of that committee, uh, FIFA had a new president uh, elected, uh, Gianni Infantino. He's our current president. He's a massive supporter for women's football. Um, he decided to establish for the first time ever a dedicated division within FIFA purely focused on women's football. And uh, I was very, very lucky to be, uh, to be selected to lead uh, that division. So it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a strange journey. I joined FIFA uh, in December 2016, so it's been three years now. Uh, it's definitely for me, I would say, the most difficult job I've ever had. Um, it's very, very challenging but I am very, very passionate about it as well. And uh, it, it keeps me motivated every day when I see uh, how much of a positive impact football can have, uh, despite the challenges. So that's... That's, <laughs> that's such an inspiring story, Sarai. I share your uh, concern uh, or your views when it comes to being in a minority, in a male-dominated uh, sphere. Um, I'm pretty much in a very similar situation in the All India Football Federation. We do have a very active women's committee. However, on the executive committee, I'm one among two women over here. And uh, the good thing is um, our voice is heard and we do make a difference. And I feel very proud of being a part of an association that actually gives us a lot of importance and uh, to not only what we say, but to our views in women's football as well. So basically, you owe your uh, interest, I think, to your Samo and heritage, to your mom. Yeah, I, ha it, I, I have to be really honest. It wasn't something that I planned. I didn't plan uh, this journey, um, but I think uh, with passion and integrity and every opportunity I was given, really, you know, giving it my all, um, and dedicating myself to it. Uh, I have been very, very fortunate um, to, to follow my pathway through to where I am today. And coming from a tiny, tiny island in the Pacific, uh, you know, it's got less than 200,000 population. Um, to be in a position now in FIFA where I have an opportunity to make an impact globally um, is, is very humbling. And uh, it's something that I often reflect on in my job. Um, it's important never to forget where you come from. And uh, that's something that drives me every day when I try to um, support other countries in developing our game. More power to you, Sarah. You have all our support. And I'm sure every other association's women's committee are only going to be supporting you. Tell us a little about your initiative of increasing 
the number of women's participation from 30 million to almost double, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> by 2026. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a big lofty goal that we have in FIFA that, uh, thank you for reminding me, <laughs> it's always hanging over my head here. Uh, we want to have 60 million women and girls playing football by 2026, which is the, the kickoff of the Men's World Cup in 26. Um, and this is really important for us because we see uh, how much women's football has affected so many women and girls around the world. And if we have a chance to double this impact, then why shouldn't we? So it is a big goal and it's something that we definitely cannot do alone for sure not. Um, and a big focus in terms of growing that participation, as I mentioned before, is around competitions. Um, competitions is so, so important when we look at driving participation. Um, it's one thing to get girls excited and attracted to women's football, but if there's nowhere for them to go and to play and to compete on a regular basis and to meet their friends, um, we lose that participation and we lose that interest. So the biggest, uh, I would say, element for us in terms of growing that number is putting a huge focus on increasing the number of women's and girls' leagues all around the world. Um, so that's one part of it. Uh, another aspect is around capacity building. So too often uh, we see a, a huge amount of effort put on the field uh, of, of coaches, trainers, players, people who are passionate about the game that are really growing the game on the grass. And quite often, uh, unfortunately, the case is it's the management and the system around the game which lets the game down. So we want to put a lot of effort into building capacity of the people who are involved in delivering the game as well. So those coaches, the ones that are on the pitch, technical people, but also off the pitch, inside the member associations, uh, strengthening the club structures, so that when we put all that effort in developing football on the pitch, it has to be sustainable. And in order for it to be sustainable, we need the people around it to be well-educated, experienced, and to have good support networks around them as well. So that's... Uh, <laughs> That's two elements to it. But to be honest, you know the strategy, the five, the five pillars? Yeah. We can't grow participation in women's football by focusing on only one of those areas. And I'm a strong, strong believer that you have to grow the entire ecosystem of women's football in order to have sustainable long-term participation and growth. So I, I often get asked the question, you know, what is the what is the one thing that we can do to, to grow women's football? And the answer is there's not one thing. You really have to address the whole ecosystem. And that's why we designed the strategy exactly with those five pillars um, that cut across all areas of the women's game. That's amazing. And uh, on a light note, I can give you a quick hack to get to 60 million. Uh, India has a population of 1.3 billion. <laughs> By 2025, 50% of our population is going to be under the age of 25. Just have a Women's World Cup in India. So that you, get, <laughs> you reach 60 million like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, this is uh, for sure. I, I mean, I don't want to be uh, biased or anything, but I'm very aware that there's a huge population in India and uh, the Under-17 Women's World Cup, we have a very strong legacy program that we've designed uh, to go alongside that World Cup. And a big target of that legacy is growing participation numbers uh, in India. So, yes, I'm very aware that we can uh, make a big dent in that target in, in India. I can assure you that everyone hearing this today and me myself personally with my foundation will give you 100% support on getting you to reach your targets of 60 billion. Um, now, um, Sarai, I'm going to just take on a few people who are going to ask you a few questions, if that's fine with you. Okay, sure. so we are getting on uh, Hiba. 
Hiba, just introduce yourself and uh, say your question, please. Okay. Hi, I'm Hiba. I am um, a player, a coach and an administrator. I play for PIFA. I also represented a Baroda FA in the IWL recently. And um, I also work with Star Sports on like the Indian uh, Super League and different professional sports leagues in India. So um, my, qu my question was actually, um, I did a little bit of research while I did my dissertation. I studied in uh, Loughborough University. So while I did my master's, I did my dissertation based on factors that motivate women in India to take up sport and football specifically and how having a national women's league would help encourage more girls to take up the sport. So um, while I was doing my research, I came across the fact that um, FIFA has funded uh, India with like about 6 million in 2007 uh, as a win in India project where they wanted to build the football uh, infrastructure. And I also believe that FIFA funded the first three seasons of the IWL because it was one of the countries that was having a national league for women. So just to give you a short synopsis about what happened in the past um, three seasons, we currently just played our fourth season with 12 teams. And our first season started off with six teams. While we had one um, team from the I-League, which is the National League of India, and one team from ISL, um, so since we had um, these teams taking part in the first season, we've grown uh, relatively well. I just wanted to know, is there a way in which um, uh, AIFF or the governing bodies come back to FIFA with a plan and a long-term goal now that the three years of funding is over because it will be difficult for AIFF to now um, fund this without having FIFA funding them. So is there like a long-term plan that they come to you with to show you the progress that has happened within the three seasons or maybe in a few more seasons? Good question. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's I, I'm interested in what you said in your introduction that you are a player, a coach and an administrator. And this is so often the case in women's football. It's one person who's doing many roles. Um, so thank you for the work that you are, you are doing. And uh, I'm also very interested to see your dissertation. If you'd like to send it to me, it would be uh, interesting yeah, reading, sure. I'm sure. Um, it's a good question. So the AIFF, um, and I, I have had many discussions with the current president, uh, Mr. Patel, um, I'm very lucky that he's one of the, the presidents who is very supportive of women's football. Um, and I think, um, you know, the fact that India will be hosting uh, the Under-17 Women's World Cup next year is a very big indicator of that. Um, I'm also in touch quite regularly with the people on the ground uh, inside the AFF, AIFF in Delhi, who are running uh, women's football from there every day. And they do have plans uh, with the league, I know for sure. Probably Anjali will know more than me being a member of the Women's Committee. Um, but I've followed the, pro the, the progress of the league. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to see the growth that it's had. And what's important for me is that the growth that is happening in every season seems to be very sustainable, which is really, really important. Um, I know that... Uh, I think the season that's just finished, I was following on social media. I think it's, if I get this wrong, please correct me. Uh, Gokulam, Gokulam yeah. Kerala FC were the champions. Um, and I know that the lead up to that final match was uh, quite hotly contested. So that was really nice to follow. And I saw that the media coverage uh, also towards the final stages of the league was really big. So that was... Um, really nice to see uh, from a FIFA level. But uh, to answer your question, so all our member associations um, across uh, the globe, they have a special funding program called FIFA Forward, uh, which is the development funding that we give uh, to our member associations to grow uh, football. And the thing about FIFA Forward, which is really important for us in women's football, is there's part of that funding um, is dedicated for the growth of women's football. And the dedicated funding for women's football has certain criteria. 
And one of the criteria uh, is that the member association must have uh, a women's national league uh, or a national league running on a, a regular basis. And it doesn't just say to have a league, but it also gives some parameters around the, the number of months that we would like the leagues to be running for, the minimum number of teams that we expect to be in those leagues. Um, and I know that that is something that uh, the AIFF through FIFA Forward um, are continually uh, to look at, um, simply because uh, one, the president is very passionate about it and there are some good people working in the administration and in the committee like Anjali who will drive it, but two, because at FIFA level, we tie certain criteria to funding linked to the league, it also incentivizes um, the AIFF and our other members to continually invest uh, in the leagues. So I hope that helps answer your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, I also had another question about the commercial aspect. Uh, you did mention that um, a part of the funds are like a part, the commercial part where you sell for say FIFA or any um, other right where you get sponsors on board. I wanted to know, is there a way where a part of this money or the funds go back to the sport or like I work at Star Sports as well. So a lot of the money that we get from sponsors is not redirected back to the sport and it's not given to governing bodies or like maybe AIFF or um, yeah, any of the governing bodies to redirect it back into the sport. So I understand for men's football, since it's already reached a certain level, it's not important for the funds of sponsors to be redirected into the sport. Whereas for women's football, since there's still like a lot that needs to be done. And since we are anyway struggling with the investment, is there a way where that money does go back into the sport? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So we have a, a, a kind of a different model at FIFA level and it, uh, it's all based around the World Cup. So for FIFA, uh, the number one revenue generating property that we have is the Men's World Cup. Yeah. And that is uh, held every four years. So, um, you know, every four years, all the money comes in from the commercial sponsors for the World Cup. And then over the next four years, that money gets distributed back to the member association and also to deliver uh, the activities from FIFA level. Then the next World Cup happens and the same thing happens again. So it runs in four year cycles and uh, the highest percentage of expenditure that we have at FIFA is returning the funding back into the member associations and to the game to develop uh, football. For Women's football, the truth is at the moment, because we're still relatively young uh, as a game, but especially uh, commercially, we rely very heavily on the income that is generated from the men's game to subsidize uh, our activities. And I think what's really important as we start to see more sponsors coming on board and more commercial interest in the women's game, it shouldn't be viewed as a threat to men's football. By commercializing women's football, it should be something that complements what already exists in the men's game. And ultimately what we gain from women's football becoming commercial is something that will benefit the whole game as a whole, not just the women's game. The challenge for us, I think, is the perception, to be honest. And I see this in many countries around the world. It's, uh, there is a negative perception uh, from many people who are uh, at high levels in the game, who are in charge of the game, that women's football is just a cost. It's an expense. It costs so much. We have to give this money for the league and the girls teams and whatever it is. And this is something that we need to change the mindset of the people who are in those decision-making bodies. You know, I don't think... Uh, there are many industries in the world where you can realize a gain or a return uh, without investing up front. And that's something that we need to start to see as a mindset change in football. Uh, our decision makers, and I'm very lucky at FIFA level, our president and general secretary uh, have fully bought into this concept. 
you have to invest in women's football in order to see the return. And that's why we've dedicated a specific amount of funding, uh, 1 billion over the next four years, specially dedicated to women's football, because we know by investing that much now and growing the game at all different levels, we will see the commercial returns start to come back. But if we don't invest first up front with a positive self-belief and understanding of where the opportunities are, we'll never be able to see those gains. So that's something that I'm often challenging uh, the decision makers when I travel around the world is to see women's football as an investment. And it's something at FIFA, Confederation, member association and club level. Um, after all, 50% of, of our world population are women and girls. Uh, so, so how can we ignore you know, that part of our population? And uh, I guess the final thing on this is, if you understand uh, in the men's game, the commercial landscape and the figures that are in the men's game around broadcasting contracts and transfer fees and just the, the, the numbers are absolutely astounding, like hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on things just like transfer fees for players. Um, and if you look uh, in contrast to that, at the women's game and the figures that are involved in the women's game now, we are a long, long way away from where the men's game is. And there are two ways you can view that. You can view that as, oh my God, we're so far away. This is unfair. Women's football is not getting enough. Or you can look at it and say, well, if there's any opportunity that exists in football right now, it's this, it's women's football. Because there's not much further that the men's game can go. It's so saturated. So if I'm a football decision maker, I'm in charge of an organization or a club, and I really want to understand where is the growth opportunities in football, it's very simple to see if you invest in women's football, that is your biggest opportunity for growth. Yeah. So happy to have that on record, Sarai. Uh, let me also just add over here that uh, women's football is relatively uh, younger than men's football. It's just been around for approximately 30 years now. So I think what we have done in the last the Women's World Cup is 30 years. And uh, what we have done in the last couple of years, FIFA has done for women, I think, is amazing. And uh, like Sarah mentioned, the growth potential is just fantastic. Uh, thanks, Hiba. Thank you for your question. Yes. And uh, Sarah, I'm going to bring on, um, you mentioned Gokulam FC, the winners of the IWL. And uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, one of the players of Oak Club FC uh -huh. of the uh, chat. And uh, she's going to be, uh, she's the goalkeeper. And she's going to be asking you the next question. Okay. Hi, uh, uh, hi this is Aditi Chauhan. I'm the goalkeeper of the national team. Um, really nice to hear from you. Um, I hope you can see me uh, on the screen. I can. Right. All right. Um, so I have uh, also graduated from Lafra like Hiba, and uh, I uh, I wanted to contribute to the development of women's uh, game in India, and that's why I've started uh, an academy called She Kids Football Academy here in De in India. And um, so my question to you is, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, to increase the participation, it's very important to have competitions, which I'm sure you were also aware that uh, we lack at the moment in India, especially at the grassroots level. Or we've, we've come a long way for the senior team. Obviously, we're playing a lot more international matches. We've got the IWL as well. Uh, but I think we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, organizing competitions for at the grassroots and at the uh, youth level. Um, so, how do you think? Uh, how important do you think it is? It is for initiatives like She Kicks, like FIFA Foundation. Uh, and I'm sure obviously there are a lot of other initiatives also across the country to work in coordination with AIFF or wor work under one umbrella, whether it's AIFF or a separate organization. And because I feel that that can have a bigger impact than these individual initiatives making their individual contributions at smaller capacities. Um, how do you think from your experience across the world from other countries which have similar demographies, similar economy, similar culture, 
like India. Um, what has been your experience and how can we benefit or how can we work uh, better to, to contribute more to the development of women's football in India? Uh, very good question. Thank you. And uh, congratulations also to you and your team for, for winning the league. And yeah, also to you, you. Uh, personally, I've uh, seen a little bit about your career overseas and, uh, yeah. you know, coming back into India with that experience that you've had and now playing in the national team and uh, setting up your, your own organization is really uh, an important aspect, I think, for, for women's football. And uh, to have a role model like you who has managed to play overseas um, and, and bring your experience back to the country is so important. So thank you very much thank um, you. for your thank contribution. You. <laughs> so I'm, a, my bit. <laughs> I'm a, a very strong believer in football, uh, reaching out to organizations outside mm. of the football family. I think this is really, really important. Um, there are so many passionate people that are involved uh, in women's football that yeah. are not uh, only inside the member associations and clubs, yeah. but also there are many foundations and other organizations outside of the game that are doing some really, really amazing work uh, at a grassroots level. So my view is that we uh, inside the football family should embrace those organizations and absolutely 100% collectively, we can make a much bigger impact than we can alone. And uh, this is something under the fifth pillar of our strategy, uh, which is the one about empowerment, um, that is a key, uh, a key driver for us, is how do we, uh, not only at FIFA level, but also with our member countries, how do we encourage them to build relationships and to embrace uh, those other organizations like non-government organizations, foundations who are working in football to collectively grow the game? Um, before the World Cup in France last year, we signed uh, for the first time an agreement with UN Women at FIFA level. And part of that agreement is working with them in each of the countries um, to see how we can um, build relationships between our member countries and non-government organizations that are working in the spaces of women's football, so those that are growing the game, but also that are working in the space of um, social development for women and girls. And if we connect um, at this level, not only can we have an impact for, for football, but we can also start to make a positive difference through football uh, for young girls and, and women around the country. It's, I have to admit, it's not always easy. Uh, I came from a, a member country and uh, I worked in a confederation before I arrived at FIFA. And I know that sometimes um, from the outside, it seems like the, the football family is very close. And it can be very hard to involve yourself or to, to try to penetrate a little bit the, um, the structures of football. Um, and that's where I think it's really important for people like Anjali, who is a member of the, the executive committee and also the women's committee, um, that they can also have a voice uh, for those other organizations. Um, and, you know, you also being a, a really big role model uh, in women's football in India, your position in the national team, but also your career. Um, it's important that you use your voice and your platform as well uh, to advocate for the work of those that are uh, not necessarily inside the football family as a way to raise awareness and to try and, and create those links. And because you are in the national team, I think you have a unique opportunity there as well because uh, you are kind of inside a little bit as a, as a national team member. So definitely um, uh, leverage that opportunity and leverage uh, the fact that you have this amazing woman here uh, who has organized this webinar. I mean, she is for you guys uh, an incredible voice for you at the top table uh, in Indian football. She sits in the executive committee. Uh, she has the air of uh, Mr. Patel, the president, 
And, you know, we need to use uh, the women that do make it into these positions. You know, we have to empower them and, and also use them to help us to drive uh, women's football forward. Those words are like sweet music to my ears, <laughs> Sarai. I've been wanting to be used to improve uh, Indian football for women for the longest time. I really want to do whatever is humanly possible for me to actually be able to help all these girls out. And, uh, you know, I, I want to just share your, um, your opinion over here, uh, uh, addressing Aditi's concern. Aditi, basically, you know, I think all of us need to take a stand in life that ask not what your association can do for you, ask what you can do for your association. Uh, I was involved with football for 17 years before I made it to the uh, women's committee and the executive committee. So there's a simple solution. Just work, work and work. Keep doing what you are doing. Keep growing your game. Keep growing the game for others. Make sure that you reach out to a lot of girls who can't afford to pay for training. You know, so like through the PIFA Foundation, we are reaching out to girls from all over the country who cannot even afford a pair of boots. Yeah. And we've been doing this for years now. It's after 17 years that my work got recognized and Mr. Patel thought I was a figure that could uh, help uh, develop football for the rest of India, you know. So I think the best advice we can give everyone on this platform is just continue doing what you're doing. Forget reaching anywhere. You will reach somewhere. And the day you hear that national anthem at the World Cup game, you have done your job. You have done your job. And even better if it's a, a Women's World Cup game, you know. So yeah. <laughs> just keep going at it and you will definitely um, succeed in whatever you are doing. Okay, um, Sarai, we have a question from uh, the India goalkeeper coach who has asked, I'll just read out what he's asking. Uh, he's asking um, uh, Mr. Rajat Guha, the goalkeeper coach for the Indian team, has asked how important it is to have uh, age group uh, tournaments for younger girls uh, leading up to the national team so as to create a pipeline for players. Good question. Uh, very, 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 very important. <laughs> very important. Yeah, the, the player pathway is very vital um, in many ways uh, in terms of uh, participation, retaining players, uh, sustainable retention of players. Uh, we have to have a pathway that leads at every age level through to the national team, but also in terms of performance, high performance. Uh, the national team can only be good and get better uh, where the pipeline or the player pathway is also strong. And what we see, uh, for example, uh, in our World Cups is it's very clear the countries that are performing well and are making it through to the knockout stages and the final stages of the World Cups, they are countries where they have clear uh, league systems that run uh, from the national team all the way down through every age group. Uh, so when you're a young girl who comes into football, uh, it's clear from the ages of six, seven, eight, whatever it is, all the way through to the national team, there's a clear step for you every way uh, in terms of competitions and tournaments. And it's the same whether or not uh, you're a national team player or, or just an amateur who loves football. You know, there needs to be a pathway for all those players so that they can continue to play football throughout uh, their lives um, until they reach a senior level, uh, playing in a league or, or uh, amateur competition, or indeed uh, for the elite players through to the national team. So the pipeline is really, really important. Um, and we see evidence of uh, the success of those countries that do have a strong pathway, uh, they are the ones ultimately who are performing at the highest level uh, at the World Cups and in the regional competitions. Very good question. Excellent coach. So there's your answer. We need to have many, many more competitions for younger girls all over the country 
so you can get many, many more Aditi Chauhans to the national team. Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I can uh, quickly add, this is one of the things that we are in discussion with AIFF and also the local organizing committee of the Under-17 Women's World Cup. Uh, one of the focus areas for the legacy program is going to be uh, to establish uh, these under-13 leagues uh, all around the country. I think focusing first on the five uh, host cities, um, but obviously uh, expanding that uh, as wide as we can on a national scale. Um, so establishing youth leagues is one of the big focuses uh, for our legacy. And uh, FIFA will be investing in that. Uh, the AIFF will also be investing in that. Um, and it's something that we hope will be sustainable also uh, after the tournament as well. Excellent. Uh, Sarai, we have a question from Sudeshna, who is a journalist from one of our leading newspapers in India called Times of India. She's from Kolkata. And she would like to ask what impact the pandemic will have on the preparations for the Under-17 World Cup. And uh, will there be any additional funding required for the hosting the tournament? Yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, obviously this is a very unprecedented time uh, for all of us, um, you know, personally in our own lives, but also, uh, you know, in any industry, not only uh, just football. So of course, uh, it's natural that there will be some changes uh, in the lead up to the, the World Cup now. Uh, because we have uh, coronavirus. Um, but I don't think it will have a negative impact, uh, to be honest, because uh, India is very experienced from organizing the Under-17 World Cup in 2017. Uh, we have a very, very competent uh, and well-led local organizing committee uh, led by Roma Khanna, who is absolutely top-notch uh, in, in her role. Um, and we have a very strong support from the government. Uh, I had a, a very uh, nice opportunity to discuss uh, with Mr. Rijiju, the, the sports minister, uh, the investment and the support for the tournament from the government level um, and also from the state levels. This support has remained. Uh, it hasn't changed because of coronavirus. Uh, if anything, for me, it's even stronger now. Um, so I don't think there will be uh, a negative impact. And uh, actually, I think coming off the back of a time like coronavirus, having an event like uh, a Women's World Cup in the country can be a very uplifting and powerful way uh, for the country to return to normal and to, to have that kind of beacon of hope that um, so many are looking for in a time like this. And, you know, obviously the health and well-being of everyone involved is the number one primary concern. Um, but the work has to continue. And uh, I have full, full confidence uh, in the local organizing committee, the federation, and also the, the government of India um, to deliver what will be, I'm sure, a world-class uh, Youth World Cup next year. We're also excited that it has not got postponed by a whole year, but just by a couple of months. And we'll all be able to see the action from the 17th of February. Yeah, all of us need to be careful and uh, stay safe and stay healthy and fit till then. But yeah, that will be something really to look forward to. The next question is uh, from a coach in India who wants to know, can you give us an example of a developing country who has reached milestones with women's football. Uh, Thailand, for example, have they done anything uh, correctly that probably India needs to follow? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, well, Thailand uh, obviously have, uh, they've done very well. Uh, we saw them participating in the, in the World Cup last year and they've invested a lot, um, uh, particularly in terms of their competition. The structure there is a, is a little bit different. And I think this is something that many of our developing countries can learn from. Um, their, their top competition is quite closely linked to the, the universities and the educational system. 
And often in developing countries, a lot of the challenges for women's football are linked to resource. Um, and how do we bring together girls, women? How do we have access to fields, infrastructure, um, and, and simple uh, resources like uh, an administrative structure? And one of the really, uh, I would say, opportunities, good opportunities that exist, um, and what we've seen happen in Thailand, is to link uh, to those educational institutions um, because naturally they are already existing institutions. They already have administrative people in place. Uh, they already provide a gathering place for many girls and women to come together for education. So there are many ingredients uh, that are already there um, that if you're uh, a club alone, um, it, it's often hard to get the resources to pull those things together. So certainly one thing, um, and FIFA recognizes this uh, a lot, uh, we are launching or we've launched uh, a football in schools program, uh, which will be uh, coming to India in the build up to the Women's World Cup. Uh, that is something where we see, uh, particularly in developing countries, we can make a big difference uh, in terms of growing our game. Uh, whether it be at primary school level for the grassroots, uh, right through to university and, and college, um, where you know the senior players can also um, contribute to, to the pathway. So I would say that's uh, definitely one thing that um, we could you could look at um, in India and, and in the individual regions and states as well. That's great news for the millions of girls, little girls in schools all over India. Because yeah, if they can get exposed to football at school, there's no better way for them to fall in love with the game. Um, Aditi would like to come on again and ask another question. Aditi? Uh, yeah. Uh, so my question, Sarah, is uh, could you share a bit more on the legacy program that is uh, planned for the Under-17 World Cup? Because um, you must have seen how dependent or how uh, excited we are about the Under-17 World Cup. And, uh, and we have a lot of expe expectations riding on the Under-17 World Cup in terms of changing the perspective uh, of people and the supporters towards the women's football game. Um, so, could you share a little bit more, uh, shed more little light on uh, uh, on the legacy program that's planned for the Under-17 World Cup? Sure. Um, there are some really cool programs that are, have been planned uh, by the local organizing committee and that FIFA will be actively uh, supporting and investing in. Um, and they cover quite a few different areas, actually. Uh, one of the focuses uh, which we, we jointly, last time I was uh, in India, I was uh, in Mumbai uh, for the launch of the, the match schedule and we, had, we took the opportunity to sit down together with the local organizing committee um, and the technical staff and women's football staff from AIFF. And one of the areas that we were focusing on in that discussion, which will uh, eventuate as a, as a legacy program, is around uh, coaching. So how do we uh, increase the number of uh, female coaches and dedicated women's football coaches across India? Because uh, if we want to grow the participation and uh, you know we have a big target as we already discussed, um, it's important that we have uh, educated coaches who are ready to take on and train and work with those girls that are coming into football. So we've identified uh, together with the AIFF, there's already an existing pool of uh, licensed coaches in India. And the idea is to upskill uh, those coaches to become instructors and to then send them out into the regions to create a pool of educated coaches uh, that are ready to take on uh, the girls that will be driven into football through the participation programs. Uh, so that's one aspect that we're really excited about. Um, and uh, for me, that is a very key thing um, if we're looking to grow the numbers. Uh, the other thing that we're looking to do is a, a very cool program called Football for All. Um, and this will be focused around uh, the five uh, host cities uh, to start with. And the idea with all the legacy programs actually is that 
in the initial build up, we focus on the five host cities. But post tournament, the idea is that they expand um, into the other regions and states outside of those five. So football for all is uh, is a way to attract uh, more young girls into the game. The idea is to have a, a, a positive first experience um, in football, especially for those that haven't been involved. And uh, you as a player, Aditi, and, and many others on this call will know, it's really important when you're entering into a sport uh, for the first time that your experience, especially for young girls, is positive. That you have fun, that you are encouraged, that you are surrounded by people who are uplifting, uh, that you can have a laugh, you can be with your friends. Um, it's really important that that first experience in any sport is a very positive one. And that, in the end, is how we keep those girls in our sport, is by providing them with that positive experience. Uh, so Football for All is, is one of those programs. Uh, another one that um, I am really excited about um, is around creating safe spaces. Uh, for girls and women to play. And uh, I know that it's not always easy, um, not only in India, but in many countries around the world, for girls to have access to fields and, and spaces where they can play uh, in a safe environment. And we have a special program with the LOC uh, in conjunction with the government, uh, where we will create uh, safe spaces and corners where girls can go um, safely to play football in a place that is identified um, where they can thrive um, within the community um, in an environment where parents can also feel um, safe to send their girls to play football there. And that one is, is something that I hope will continue long after the World Cup um, and it takes a, a big community focus as well because uh, it's not only about having a, a safe Space for those girls to play, but also understanding how do they get there? Are they work? Are they walking? You know, uh, it, are the places where they walk are they safe? You know, is the access for them um, fully open? So that's something um, that is also um, one of the, the the legacy programs. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head of all the programs that we've got. Um, yeah, I would say that those are kind of the, the highlights that I can remember off the top of my head. Uh, there are many more for sure. And uh, as we discussed earlier, you know, we, we understand very clearly that there are, are 1.3 billion people in India and uh, we have a huge opportunity in that respect to grow our game. And we see the Under-17 Women's World Cup as the catalyst for that growth. So. Every tournament that we run uh, at FIFA level has a legacy component. Um, and I have to uh, tell you that the youth uh, competitions, the legacy programs and the investment that we have planned for this under 17 Women's World Cup is more than we have ever had for any other youth competition uh, from the women's perspective. And that's because uh, we really see a massive opportunity uh, not only for FIFA, but for, for girls and women in India to, to have a positive impact from this competition. And we're going to need everybody. We're going to need every, everybody on this call, FIFA, all the organizations, your organization, Aditi, this is not something that we can do alone. So we're going to need everybody that is passionate about women's football that are already involved in the game, to get on board with us uh, in the build up to the World Cup and even afterwards to really leverage uh, the momentum that we will gain and the attention that we will have. And the cool thing is that the government is also heavily invested. Uh, we have a, a strong support from the government in terms of legacy as well. I know that uh, Kiran Rajiju is very passionate about having established ongoing competitions uh, and uh, yeah, so this is something that we must, must leverage and we have to use this momentum. This opportunity uh, is only going to come around, you know, once every so often. So we've got to grip it and get as much as we can from it for women's football. 
Thanks, uh, Sarai, for that answer. It's uh, very clear for everyone to see what exactly the legacy program for the boys game had. Uh, after 2017, the boys game has taken it to much, much higher levels than ever before. And we are very, very confident the LOC, AIFF and FIFA together will make sure that the legacy program for the women's game is no less successful. Uh, our next question is from uh, Shauna Sen from Bangalore, who runs an organization called the Past Collective. Shauna says UEFA and Disney recently released Playmakers, a storytelling platform specifically targeting young girls that showcase Disney cartoon characters having fun in physical activity and specifically playing football. What are some creative initiatives you've seen to get more girls out playing football at a mass level? How can such initiatives spread globally and to India? Yeah, uh, very good question. Yes, uh, Disney Playmakers is a recently launched program uh, from UEFA and it's a very, very cool program. I mean, every uh, young girl around the world has some kind of... Uh, affinity to the different Disney characters and uh, this is one way for sure that we can seek to popularize our sport. Um, their initiative um, is based around, uh, I think, the, I can't remember what they're called, the fantastic, uh, the family with all the stretchy limbs and the different, they basically have these different characters from that movie. Um, fantastic uh, girl. Four, is it? Fantastic Four or something. I can't, I can't remember what it's called. But it's this family of characters. Um, the Incredibles. Incredibles, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> the Incredibles. So basically yeah. all the characters uh, in this family um, are challenge the audience to do different exercises and become active. Um, and it's something that is so cool because you can do it together as a family. And particularly in a moment like this, when many uh, countries around the world have put their people into lockdown and they're spending a lot of time inside and, and at home. So it's a really nice way to get families active together um, and uh, tying it to the Incredibles, uh, who are a really popular characters, is something um, that they've worked quite well on. Um, other initiatives that I've seen that are, are quite successful, um, another one from UEFA is called the We Play Strong campaign, um, and you can look that up actually online, hashtag We Play Strong, um, and that is focused on an older age group. It's really focused around girls around the age of 12 or 13 years old, and the idea behind We Play Strong is to try and make football cool for them. Because uh, what you see, um, and this is based on research that UEFA had done in Europe, is that at that age of around 12 or 13, that is where uh, young girls uh, start to really uh, focus more about their social situation, you know, and what is cool to do. I want to be in with the cool crowd and, and you know, so the idea is uh, through the We Play Strong campaign, is to target that particular audience um, because often what we see in that age group is where the biggest dropout in terms of participation happens. So young girls who have been playing the game up until the age of 12, 13, it's when they hit that particular age group that we see the biggest decline in numbers. And, and there are many reasons for that, but one of the key reasons is because it's socially um, not seen as the cool thing to be doing uh, amongst girls those age. So, so We Play Strong is designed to flip that on its head and to make uh, women's football or girls' football for those girls uh, the cool thing to do in that age category. And they've got some really awesome stuff that they do. Uh, they do live Instagram lives. Uh, they have a YouTube channel. Um, they link it also to fashion. They have top players, you know, showing their things that are basically attractive to young girls of that age group. Um, so I think it's important also to see how can you market and communicate to women's football differently to what you do in men's football. We have uh, a different audience 
that have different values and different interests. And it's important when we try to reach out um, to that audience that we don't have the same approach as we do in the men's game. It's not always about who's the best player, who's scoring the best goals, you know, the top leagues in the world and everything. It's a different audience and we have to adapt the way we communicate um, to target that audience. Yeah. What a fresh perspective that is, right? Because um, that's, I think, what is absolutely needed to make football cool again. You know, there's a general perspective that, you know, girls who play football are masculine and, you know, they are manly and they, are, they lose all their girly charm because they play football. But that's not true at all. In so many years that I'm playing uh, and have been associated with the game, I think girls can maintain being as girly and beautiful and charming as possible while playing a fantastic game out there on the field. So yeah, this program is really very, very good news. And uh, I hope a lot of people learn from it that you know you can be both. You can be a strong football player and as feminine as you need to be. Exactly. Uh, so we've actually got 25 more questions, but I'm not going to be asking. <laughs> 25 more actually, uh, Sarai, but I'm not going to be asking you all the questions. Uh, just, I'm just going to be picking up a few of them. Uh, one of them that um, Vaidehi asks is, um, what do we need to do to make women's football more professional? Uh, we do have less funding, but that shouldn't stop women's football from people seeing it as a professional sport. What can women do to become more professional about the game? Yeah, very good question. Uh, and yeah, I think this is a question that will be key to sustainable uh, development and growth uh, in women's football. Uh, for me, the answer to that, it has to be a, a, a two-pronged approach. It needs to be looked at uh, from the top down, but also from the bottom up. So from the top down, uh, depending on, on where you are in the world and what organization you're in, um, it's important to drive a professionalization from, from that level. So uh, let me give you an example. At FIFA, uh, I talked to you guys uh, before about the international transfer matching system um, and understanding the data about how women's players are moving and what kind of uh, contracts are they being paid, these sort of things. Um, if we know that at the top level at FIFA, we can develop specific programs and support designed around that ecosystem. Um, and the idea behind that and the work that we do in professionalization is to try and accelerate um, the elite level of women's football. The truth is, uh, and, and I know this very well coming from the Pacific and Samoa, what we saw in France uh, in the World Cup last year was fantastic, but it's a far, far cry from the reality for the vast majority of people involved in women's football. We know that there's only a very small handful of countries and leagues around the world where women are playing professionally, but 90 to 95% of our member associations and those that play the women's game are amateurs. They're not involved at these high levels that you see in the Women's World Cup and in the top leagues around the world. So whilst we put a lot of focus at the top end on accelerating the elite level, a big focus and uh, I would say the biggest part of our investment into women's football is at the grassroots level uh, and the bottom up approach. And there, in order to professionalize uh, women's football, it really is about making sure that all the elements at the grassroots level are educated, they have access to support, that they are, um, you know, there are people involved who are key decision makers within the clubs or the football organizations, um, and that even the coaches, the people on the pitch, you know, they are educated, they are licensed, they understand the game well. Um, and in women's football, that often means it's, it's the people who are passionate. Uh, sorry, I can't remember her name who asked a question before. She said she's a player, a coach, and an administrator. Iba. 
Yeah, okay. Well. So she's a perfect example. There are people uh, who are involved in women's football and they do it because they're so passionate about it. And that's something that I see everywhere I go in the world. And often it is the case, unfortunately for the time being, that it is one person uh, who is really doing everything. They're the coach. They also do the communications and the media. At the same time, they do all the administrative work. Uh, they're also the same one who's trying to market the game and get all the commercial sponsors on board. It's normally one or two really passionate people. And I think the best thing that we can do to try and professionalize from the grassroots level is to support those people, to educate them, to give them opportunities and capacity building and really expose them to um, high level experiences so that they can in, in return um, apply that into the areas where they are working as well. But uh, it's, it's a very good question. There's no one thing. It's all the ecosystem around the grassroots game that needs to grow. Thanks, Sarai. We're going to have one last question. Um, what is your message out to everyone listening to football, all the people who are involved in today's uh, webinar, uh, everyone who are involved some way or the other with women's football. What is your parting message you can give everybody so that we can see India take women's football to the next level? <laughs> I feel pressure now. Okay. Um... I would say, especially after the past uh, seven, eight weeks being in this coronavirus situation, my number one message to everyone here is to remain positive. And what I mean in that is also to be positive in the way that you speak, in the way that you interact, when you talk about the woman's game, don't look at it as something that it's negative and it's hard and we don't have resources and we're struggling because of this, that or the other. Because in all honesty, if that is the way that we are talking about women's football, not only in India, but everywhere around the world, the only thing that is going to come back to us is that same level of negativity. And I think it's really important for those that are in the women's game, despite the challenges that we see and that we're facing every day, we must be positive about the way that we speak about it, about the way we approach it. When we are engaging with others who are not involved in women's football, you need to talk to them with the same passion that it is that brings you into women's football. Um, and this is something particularly now in the time of coronavirus that we have to really try to exude. There are so many uh, negative articles and, and negative things that we see in the media and on social media about women's sports and women's football. And we need to change this dialogue and be much more positive. And I think there are so many opportunities for women's football, for our players, for all those that are involved. And when you are faced with that level of opportunity, you know, we can only be positive about it. And uh, yeah, that would be uh, my key message. And also just to thank you all. Um, I know that the people that are involved uh, in this webinar are those that are passionate about the women's game. It's been something that you have all had to sign up for. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing. Really, really from the bottom of my heart, we could not progress the women's game without people like you advocating for us every day on the ground level. Um, I want you to know that we are here with you. We are supporting. I know that it so often seems like FIFA is so far away and something that is so unknown and just, but it's not the case. Honestly, I'm with you guys every day. I follow closely everything that is happening. And I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you that are involved. Um, it really, really makes such a huge impact for us. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. And on that positive wow. note, we would all like to join in thanking you from the bottom of our hearts, Sarai. You have taken two hours of your time and being so kind as to enlighten everyone FIFA's perspective on Indian football. We all 
know one thing for sure. Indian football is exploding at its seams and it's just waiting to become the next big thing in India. And we know we have a friend in you who will always be there to guide us and show us the right way and the right way forward. Thank you so much, Sarai. On behalf of myself and everybody, we would like to thank you for accepting to be our speaker today. It's been my pleasure. And thank you. And good luck uh, for, the, for the rest of the series. Uh, very, very cool initiative. So thank you to the PIPA Foundation and also to you, Anjali, for this awesome initiative. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to tune in uh, to one of the, the up and coming webinars as well. Absolutely. We will keep you uh, informed and share links with you for all our future initiatives. Signing off here. Thanks, Sarai. Thank you very much, everybody. Have bye a good bye. evening. Bye bye, Sarai. For everyone else signing in, thank you very much for taking part in this very enlightening uh, session we had with Sarai Bremen, the head of women's football FIFA. I'm sure all of you have had a really fantastic time and have learned a lot that you need to know about uh, what all is happening at FIFA level and the initiatives that are being done for Indian football.